Hello. I'm ready. Welcome. Thank you all so much for being here. We're really excited to have you back. Happy New Year and welcome to January History Cafe, Seattle Sports and Urban Progress. My name is Sora, I use they them pronouns, and I work in public programs here at Mohai. And before we begin, I have a couple housekeeping notes for y'all. If you need a restroom, they are through the cafe to the left past the deli case. And thank you for wearing masks at all times while not actively eating or drinking throughout tonight's events. We're in the middle of a large COVID surge, so it's really appreciated. History Cafe is a series presented in partnership with History Link on the third Wednesday of every month. Hey, Jen. And tonight's schedule of events. We'll start with about an hour of presentation with some trivia intermixed, so get ready to get your thinking caps on. And then we'll have about a 30-minute Q&A followed by a book signing. Tonight, we'll be reflecting on Seattle's sports history and its impact on the fabric of our city. And with that in mind, it's critical that we acknowledge the people who are here first, playing and living and stewarding this land. And here at Mohai, we are on the historic and contemporary lands and waters of the Duwamish, Suquamish, Muckleshoot, and all Coast Salish people. Historically, Native communities were forcibly removed from this city with lasting impacts to today. That said, we honor their continued endurance with deep respect and gratitude for their unbroken stewardship of this place. We encourage you to visit the websites of local tribes to learn more about the people whose land you're on. Tonight's speaker is Sean Scott, a Seattle-based writer, abolitionist, and organizer. He's the author of Millennials and the Moments That Made Us, a cultural history of the US from 1982 to present, and the new book, Heartbreak City, Seattle Sports and the Unmet Promise of Urban Progress. Please give him a warm welcome. Sora, thanks so much for that uh, the wonderful introduction. Um, it's great to be here with everybody this evening, a, uh, putting together a book that spans uh, some 170 years of history um, that takes up about 230 pages worth of space, each one precious, of course, um, is a lot of work. It's a lot of work that takes place in isolation um, and a lot of work that takes place at times where you don't necessarily feel like writing or researching, but you do it anyway because you imagine nights like this where um, people will come out to want to hear about um, the topic that you've been delving into. This was an especially fun topic to write and research about. Um, I knew that um, when I sort of first had the first conversations with the University of Washington Press about putting together um, a book proposal, the um, energy that I had in mind was something that I would be able to think and talk and write and speak about and research at any point of the day. Seattle politics and Seattle sports fit both of those criteria, so um, I thought it would probably be a good idea to try to put those two together for um, a book project. Um, so it's just awesome to be here with everybody. I want to I want to take a, a moment to sort of clarify what exactly it is that we're going to be talking about tonight. I want to do a countdown of the ten most uh, politically impactful sports figures in Seattle history. Um, but what we're not doing is we're not talking about the ten best athletes in the city sports history, right? If we were to talk about who could run the fastest or jump the highest or um, anything like that, uh, there would be a lot of names that are on this list that probably um, would be swapped out for some others. I think about um, Doris Heritage Brown pictured here, who was actually the first uh, woman, a Seattle runner who was the first woman to run a sub a five minute mile in 1966. She's somebody who would probably um, be um, at or near the top of this list. If anybody here has ever tried to run a sub five minute mile, you know why. Um, somebody like Warren Moon would probably be on this list when we look at, you know, um, the NFL playoffs are going on right now with, you know, so many black quarterbacks like Patrick Mahomes and um, Lamar Jackson, Jordan Love, others that um, throwing the ball really far, you know, tremendous scrambling ability. Um, Warren Moon was kind of the, the forerunner to all of them, and his career actually started here in the University of Washington, where he endured uh, significant racism as a black quarterback and a pioneer in that respect. He's somebody who would probably be on this list um, if we were talking about the best athletes proper. Um, somebody like Bernie Morris, who was at his point, um, or during his day, one of the fastest skaters in the world, 
um, somebody who led the offensive attack of the 1917 Seattle Metropolitans. Um, he's somebody who would probably be on this list as well if we were talking about the best athletes, but that's not what this conversation is about, right? This conversation is really about um, not athletes that would be the most likely to win the fight, but I think athletes that were the most indicative of fights to make Seattle a more progressive city, to make the United States a more progressive uh, union generally. Um, so as a result, there are actually a few names at this list, particularly at the top, that would probably be on both lists, and we'll get into that. Um, but uh, there are also some figures in this, um, in this countdown that we're gonna do that are not necessarily athletes, but that still had a really, really huge impact on the city and its politics. We're talking about huge gobs of public resources devoted to big stadiums. We're talking about groups of people that uh, are typically in the margins of mainstream politics that are suddenly closer to the center because they were following galvanizing uh, athletes and teams that represented marginalized communities and backgrounds. Um, and in, ultimately, I think it's gonna be a lot more far ranging of a discussion than it would be if we were just talking about what was taking on between uh, the, the lines of play, as it were. Um, it, this was not planned, uh, but today is actually Muhammad Ali's birthday. I can't really think about um, a better athlete to sort of get this conversation started off. Um, when you think about Muhammad Ali as somebody who was an anti-imperialist, somebody who was a civil rights uh, icon at a time where it was not popular to be a civil rights icon, um, somebody who spoke out against uh, the worst impacts of U.S. militarism at home and abroad. Um, Muhammad Ali was somebody who I think has to be at the top of any list, whether you're talking about impactful athletes or people who are just really, really good at doing what they did. Um, this quote I actually thought about quite a lot, um, often during the writing process, when Muhammad Ali says, I hated every minute of training, but I said, don't quit, suffer now, live the rest of your life as a champion. I promise he was talking about boxing and not about um, historical research, but that doesn't mean that there wasn't some cross-application there. So wanted to get us started on that note with uh, January 17th being uh, Muhammad Ali's birthday. Um, and what a great sort of spirit to gather um, around today as we're getting ready to talk about political impact in sports. Um, Heartbreak City was is a book that, as I mentioned earlier, spans uh, about 170 years of history. Uh, it doesn't have innings, or it doesn't have chapters, it has innings. Um, we go from the first inning in the Progressive Era, the second inning in the 1920s, all the way down to the present day. And I wanted to try to put together a book that unfolded as much like a novel uh, as one that unfolded like a history book. So, um, you know, any great nonfiction that you read or watch um, is going to have defined characters, it's going to have strong motivations, it's going to have people that you meet that leave an impression, whether they're on the screen or the page, as it were, uh, for a short or a very long time. So really what this is about tonight, I think, is just kind of an introduction of some of the characters that I thought were um, some of the most central to the story that we're getting ready to uh, tell about the city and its history and its relationship to sport. And I want to get us started off at number 10, one of my favorite characters before we um, reveal who this is, I want to take a second to um, read an excerpt from my book that sort of frames up uh, what this figure meant to the city at the time that he was around. As the hardy Gilded Age gave way to the Progressive Era, brainy city bureaucrats and recalc recalcitrant labor leaders replaced the brawny pioneers of yesteryear. Seattle founder Arthur Denny was disgusted. Quote, if people possessed more of the spirit of the old settlers, he wrote near the turn of the century, we were here less about a conflict between labor and capital. We had no eight or even 10 hour days and I never heard of anyone striking. Every man who was worthy of that name struck at whatever obstacle stood in the way of his success, end quote. If masculinity was in a crisis in the progressive era, many believed that the full extent of the problem could be seen in the sorry state of University of Washington football. Established in 1889, the University of Washington football team had some success at the turn of the century, typified by a smash mouth 2 0 win against Nevada that clinched the Pacific Coast Championship in November of 1902. But as Seattle became a more, but as Seattle became a more mature city as the 1900s progressed, separating itself from the wild past, its wild past with manicured parks and new rules regulating violent sports, UW football seemed to grow soft. After the subpar 1907, 
an article in the college's alumni publication titled, What's the Matter with Washington Athletics, argued that the school was too preoccupied with contemporary distractions. Quote, too much society, too many social stunts, too many young men and women wasting energy cleaning, too much competition among the sororities and fraternities as to which, could, which, to give, which could give the biggest social affair, end quote. It was time to get tough again. In 1908, Washington searched for a new coach to reinvigorate its football program. School officials decided on Gilmore Doby, who hadn't lost a game in four years as head honcho at a Minneapolis high school and at North Dakota State. Upon arriving in Seattle, Doby laid the gauntlet to players and fans alike. He challenged Washington students to come out and support a winner and inadvertently coined the mascot name the team would come to be known by in the coming years. Quote, the Huskies must come out, and if they do not, the rest of you must get them out, end quote. Born January 21st, 1878, Robert Gilmore Doby was a hard-boiled product of the Gilded Age who had worked as an indentured child laborer after his destitute parents orphaned him in the 1880s. A real thin man, Doby donned a black trench coat to look tough. He wore sweaters made from animal skins. He chewed cigars on the sidelines and cursed out referees. He liked to remind Washington players of his personal motto, quote, I'm always right, and you are always wrong, end quote. <laughs> Gil Doby challenged the whole team to a fight, but had no takers. He made them run 20 laps after they won a game by 70 points. Why wasn't it 100? Football was figurative war. In his nine seasons as Washington's head coach, Doby's team never lost. From 1908 to 1916, it went 58-0-3, decimating rivals, earning Seattle national praise and attention, and setting a standard for competitive excellence that went utterly unmatched. In anticipation of a November 1915 game between Washington and California, a Washington alum penned the fight song, Bow Down to Washington, which remained a fixture at Husky football games. Washington creamed rival California 72 to nothing, and after the game, the New York Times confessed that the best in the West was the best bar none. Quote, turn the, fo turn the spotlight so it may shine upon the most remarkable coach in college football, Gilmore Doby, pilot of the football destiny of the University of Washington in Seattle, end quote. So if you, if you happen to watch the uh, national championship game a few weeks ago, I'd, I suspect that there could be a lot of people that wish that we had a coach like Gil Doby at the uh, command of <laughs> our team at that, at that particular juncture. But when we look at um, the University of Washington today, a you know, huge uh, multi-million dollar, I believe it was a $280 million renovation of Husky Stadium that took place in 2013. Um, huge sums of, of public research funds that are generated as a result of the advertisement of the college that um, college football plays a huge role in. I think that that's where you would see sort of Gilmore Doby as a central figure in the story of how Seattle um, developed its love affair with sports. I mean, this was really one of the first figures that we saw um, helm a team to a national title in Seattle, though certainly not the last. Um, and so uh, I would put Gilmore Doby somewhere at the, at the top of this list, so that's why I have him ranked here at, uh, at number 10 before we move on to our, our next slide. All right. So our next figure, anybody who's, who may have, um, maybe you've taken transit to a Seahawk or a Mariner game, this name is probably familiar to you. Um, Royal Brom Way was named after uh, this man, Royal Brom, who was at one point in time the preeminent sports columnist in the city of Seattle, uh, somebody who uh, worked as uh, the team statistician for the Seattle Mets as they went on their Stanley Cup uh, run in 1917, um, somebody who was um, in his, I believe it was 84 years of life, was a sports booster without parallel. Um, when he ended up passing away, and I should point out the story of his passing was um, is covered in the in the book. He actually died uh, at a Seahawks game. There's a very very tight uh, game between uh, the Seahawks and Broncos that um, led to this man's expiration. And um, it, it's kind of fitting because I mean his his life and his work and his obsession was Seattle sports. So it was kind of fitting that it was the Seahawks that sent him to um, one last final rest. But um, he was somebody who. Um, advocated in the 1960s for the arrival of the Seahawks and Mariners or the construction of the stadium that led to their arrival. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, somebody who pushed for the integration of the city sports throughout the 40s and 50s. Many bowling leagues in the city of Seattle were racially exclusive. 
um, a, a national Japanese American organization had written him a letter in the late 40s thanking him for um, pushing for the integration of bowling um, alleys across the city. Um, he was somebody who, when youth athletes were sort of putting their imprint on um, the sports fabric of the country um, with the University of Washington rowing team and Helene Madison, who we're going to get to shortly, um, is really the first Seattle sports superstar. He was one of the first people to beg the question of why can't these athletes end up getting paid for their labors, even though they're youth athletes, that's no excuse for them um, having to live oftentimes in poverty. So Roel Braum was, um, you know, somebody who I think his, his biography sort of serves as um, the backdrop and the through story through the first six or seven chapters of the book. Um, and it's definitely somebody I would encourage everybody to read about in, uh, if not my book, then um, online, right? Helene Madison at number eight. Um, I, I think of all the historical personages, people that I had the opportunity to learn about for the first time in the course of researching this book, uh, she was one of the ones who left one of the most profound um, and lasting impressions on me personally as a writer. Um, she was somebody who at one point in time owned uh, in the early 1930s, uh, practically every women's swimming record that was in existence. Uh, somebody who cleaned up at the 1930 uh, U.S. National Championships in Miami and then again at the uh, 1932 uh, Summer Olympics in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, the Washington Athletic Club was a backer, a booster of hers, um, raised funds for her ability to travel, to compete at these national games at which Seattle uh, was finally recognized as um, a sports destination town, largely as a result of her exploits. Unfortunately, she was also somebody, um, as a result of being somebody who did not get paid for um, her work, who led a very, very difficult and hard life um, later on as she eventually expired in, in 1970. Um, but we've seen, you know, over the past few months, uh, you know, a lot of, I mean, I feel like collectively Seattle, we get together and every, you know, seven or eight years or so, we, we, we get together and, deter and, and ask ourselves whether or not the boys are still in the boat with the rowing team, right? And we checked with Dan Brown's book in 2013. Boys were definitely in the boat at that time. There's a George Clooney film that's come out. Um, good to see that they're still there. Um, and it's unfortunate to me that I think that um, Helene Madison, who was really somebody who laid the fundraising template that the University of Washington rowing team eventually enjoyed in 1936, was somebody who's been kind of written out of that history, unfortunately. Um, so being able to tell her story in the course of this book, and she's covered quite a lot in the uh, third inning, which covers the 1930s, um, was something I wanted to make a point to do because I think that there are a lot of people that um, just sort of assume that the first and greatest thing that you hear about what was going on with Seattle sports in the 1930s was sort of the only thing, um, when really there was uh, quite a trailblazer that we had um, in Helene Madison as well. So I would um, encourage everybody to check out more about Helene Madison. I believe it was a historian, Maureen Smith, who called her Seattle's first individual homegrown superstar. I think that's accurate. Uh, Bernie Morris uh, on the the striker for the uh, Seattle Mets was somebody who, um, you know, earned a lot of uh, fame and recognition here in the city of Seattle, but was not necessarily from here. Um, and so somebody like Helene Madison, who learned to swim at Green Lake, uh, was from the neighborhood of Wallingford, um, enjoyed local fundraising support, um, certainly de deserves a lot of recognition as I think Seattle's first, as Marine Smith put it, um, homegrown superstar in the city of Seattle. All right, we want to do some trivia? Okay. So we're going to take a break from the countdown and pose this question. I want to, I want to see if anybody might have the answer to this question. Profiled in Jet Magazine in the 1970s, this University of Washington staffer helped to acclimate athletes of color to campus life, earning praise and respect from the likes of Spencer Haywood and Warren Moon. Anybody have a stab at who this might be? Some famous siblings? She was. Is. Uh, Gertrude Peoples. Hey! Got it. So this, this first trivia question is definitely on, on difficult mode. It's going to get a little bit easier a little bit later, but um, kudos to you for getting that right. I was almost certain that nobody was going to get that and, and guess it as casually as you guessed it as well. So well done. 
The answer was Gertrude Peoples. Gertrude Peoples. Um, yeah, she was somebody who, um, at a point in time when the University of Washington in the 70s as a result of the civil rights movement um, and, and campus movements to make the school and the college more inclusive uh, was brought on and um, many of the athletes that were able to attend the University of Washington as a result of athletic scholarships sort of cited her as a very, very important part of their um, on-campus support system. Um, so you have like a whole generation of athletes that um, at a point in time where, let's face it, Seattle was a segregated city in the 1970s, a city that in the 70s was in the middle of a really nasty dispute over whether or how to integrate its schools with forced busing, um, a city that in uh, 1964, only a few years earlier, I believe, had voted down an open housing uh, integration measure. Um, for black athletes in particular, and, and Warren Moon's story, which I talk about in the seventh inning of the book, um, he was somebody who was the subject of a, of a lot of racism on campus, and I think Gertrude Peoples was somebody who helped sort of buffer him and other athletes as well from the hostility of the sort of surrounding um, city. So Gertrude, Pe Gertrude Peoples, congrats to you for guessing that. I'm, I'm impressed. Um, all right, so back to the countdown. All right, Lenny Wilkins and Spencer Haywood, these two are kind of linked in history as former members of the uh, Seattle Supersonics who, um, actually I think I'm gonna read an excerpt about the both of them. Um, and this is from the uh, seventh inning of the book called Fade Away. The last floor, please, Sean. Briefly in 1975, sophomore football prospect Warren Moon was classmates with a man who helped to integrate the National Basketball Association. Warren Moon was a Seattle pioneer in his own right, a young man venturing to play the quarterback position in an era when it was largely denied to black athletes. Spencer Haywood, meanwhile, was a bona fide basketball star taking college classes in his spare time and moonlighting as, campus, as a campus jazz radio show host while playing for the Seattle Sonics. Life was good. At a time when the average player's salary was, was about $700,000, the six foot eight, 225 pound forward Spencer Haywood was on a six year, $8 million deal with Seattle. Back in 1971, the US Supreme Court had ruled in Haywood's favor in the case Haywood versus National Basketball Association when he sued the NBA over a rule that disallowed players from entering the league unless they were four years removed from high school. After the Sonics were blocked by the league when they tried to sign him, Haywood successfully argued in court that the rule was discriminatory. Most players who were impacted by it were black, poor, and playing basketball to get out of poverty. The NBA knew this. Slowing the flood of young, gifted, and black players was a way for conservative white team owners to control how their legacy was, how their league was perceived, and to retain power in it. Quote, I ain't Jackie Robinson, recalled Haywood, but in a way, I was. Journalist David Halberstam's The Breaks of the Game relays that in the 1970s, the NBA's players came from the ghettos of cities in the post-industrial age, but its new markets were in Denver, in Portland, in Seattle. With the civil rights movement still smoldering, professional basketball seemed caught in a bind. How would the NBA market a black urban sport to a growing white suburban fan base? On NBA on CBS broadcasts in the 1970s, musical cutaways to commercials toggled between the blonde crooner Olivia Newton-John and the black-led soul band MFSB, a telling act of musical vertigo that signaled basketball's attempted cross-racial appeal. The 1977 NBA Finals between the Philadelphia 76ers and the Portland Trailblazers modeled the demographic tensions that tugged at the league. And as Portland hoisted the championship trophy, Lenny Wilkins watched from Seattle with disgust. Wilkins was the Supersonics' director of player personnel in 1977, from 1974 to 76, he was the head coach of the Portland Trailblazers and only one of five black NBA coaches since the league began in 1946. It was Wilkins who mentored Bill Walton during his rookie and sophomore seasons, helping to mold the young hippie into the NBA Finals MVP he became. It was Wilkins who coaxed the Trailblazer roster into winning form, crafting the nucleus that won the championship. And it was Wilkins who Portland management fired in 1976, replacing him with white coach Jack Ramsey. The very next year, the Trailblazers were champs. 
That was Lenny team, Lenny's team, only it wasn't anymore. Beneath the calm demeanor, Wilkins simmered. Born October 28, 1937, Leonard Randolph Wilkins was raised in the Bedford-Stuyvesant neighborhood of Brooklyn. After a stint with the St. Louis Hawks, he was traded to Seattle in 1969. When Wilkins took on the role of player coach in Seattle, Seattle fans sent the team hate mail. But the team improved under him, posting its first winning record in franchise history in 1972. And while the two were teammates in Seattle, Wilkins saw Spencer Haywood's struggle as intertwined with his own. Blacks and managerial positions were as rare as empowered black players. Like Haywood, Wilkins was a pioneer of post-civil rights professional sports, navigating the world of white elites with few roadmaps for doing so. This is a, a name that should be familiar to Seattleites of all generations. Just by show of hands, can I see if you, the name Jim Ellis rings a bell? Okay. So uh, Jim Ellis was actually an, a resident of, or he was born in Oakland, um, somebody who moved to the Seattle, moved to the Seattle area in the post uh, World War II era, um, a urban planner and a Republican actually who was instrumental to the founding of the Metro Agency to help clean up uh, Lake Washington, which was at that point, um, well, it was filthy. There was a lot of a huge boom in post-World War II growth in the area. Um, a lot of the city's social services infrastructure was unprepared for that growth. Uh, the water, which we see as, per, as relatively pristine today, um, was not what it looked like, certainly in the 1950s. Um, First-hand accounts describe it as looking rather like, like split pea soup. Um, and so Jim Ellis's uh, effort to help clean up Lake Washington uh, was really only the first of a number of schemes that he had to make Seattle a more uh, progressive place, a place that actually lived up to the environmental reputation that um, it would uh, come to enjoy. Um, this was, I mean, it, I'm just trying to wrap my head around a Republican in the present saying, uh, this quote, there are warning signs that urban conditions are engulfing in their potential trouble. Okay, maybe you can imagine a Republican saying that part, but um, <laughs> the conflict between people and vehicles growing more deadly, the air we breathe changing its, competition, its composition, segregation exploding in its charge of injustice. Uh, in the late 1960s, Jim Ellis had an idea that uh, in his mind was going to help prepare Seattle for uh, the increased sort of spurt of growth that it was seeing even at that point in time. His idea was to come up with a slate of electoral initiatives called Forward Thrust. Uh, this was a, a slate of 13 ballot initiatives that included a mass, a plan for uh, uh, mass rail transit and a sports facility um, that eventually became the kingdom. In Jim Ellis's mind, if you had um, sort of, sort of a, I want to say civic uh, sort of uh, booster amenities that played to Seattle's desire to become a big league city at the same time that you had sort of nuts and bolts funding for parks for transit and things of that sort um, that any given item on this electoral slate called for a thrust would be more likely to pass as a result um, and so this went before voters in two separate elections one in 19 February of 1968 another a uh, couple of years later in February of 1970 um, you can probably guess how the story turned out. I mean, the facility that we see at the top, that is the kingdom, which for a quarter century, 24 years, was home to the Seattle Seahawks and the Mariners when it was uh, opened. Uh, I believe it was in 1975. The Seahawks followed a year or so later. The Mariners followed a couple of years later. Um, and nonetheless, Jim Ellis was somebody who was very heartbroken by the result of those elections because that was not his ultimate goal, right? His ultimate goal was this would have been built in 1985 were it not for the fact that Seattle voters had rejected the forward thrust uh, proposal. I see a lot of shaking heads right now. This is the urbanist version of the Malcolm Butler play, right? Like you have people that were not alive in 1968 or 1970, people that had nothing to do with mid-century politics that when they see this map, they shake their heads and they cannot understand how Pete Carroll did not run the ball, right? That's. <laughs> what this image comes to mind. That's what this, that's, that's the emotion that it evokes. That's how it makes us feel. Um, nonetheless, Jim Ellis, I think very deserving of this spot. And so I decided to put him at number five. I think he might actually be the highest ranked uh, non-athlete on this list, um, which I think says a lot. 
All right, trivia break. This was, you know, you weren't supposed to get this right because I was supposed to do a big reveal with the answer with this here. So we're just going to kind of race through the slide. Um, congrats again, um, Gertrude Peoples. Look at that. All right, we'll do another trivia break. The Seattle Storm won the WNBA championship in 2004. It was the city's first major sports championship since the Sonics won the title in 1979. Which Seattle Storm player won the 2004 WNBA Finals Most Valuable Player Award? A hand is shot up. Tim Bird? Sorry. What? No, one guess per, per participant. <laughs> I'm not going to just start naming names over here. I saw, I think your hand went up. Lauren Jackson? Nope. Anybody else? I saw one over to the, over to the left. This is supposed to be the easy one, Hello? the easier one. Do you have one? Anybody? Anybody else? Well, this is awkward. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got one back here. Is it Betty Lennox? Hey, there we go. Congratulations. Yeah, Betty Lennox. Um, we'll save this for a little bit later. I'm going to go into this a little bit more, but congrats on getting this right, and we're going to talk about Sue Bird a little bit later, I promise. These two guys look familiar. Kind of cheating. I lumped them into into one, but I feel like for anybody who watched this team, it's kind of difficult to not think of them as as a tandem. Um, I'm going to say that uh, the political impact that uh, these two players, Gary Payne and Sean Kemp, had on the city of Seattle, where the other figures that we sort of looked at, it was a positive impact. It was measured in uh, stadiums left behind and in groups engaged. This is more about negative space, and I think the sense of loss that a lot of people still feel from. Uh, the team that these two guys once played for. So I'm going to take a second to read an excerpt from um, a chapter of the book called Loserville, USA um, that kind of gets at the sense of, of why these two might be on this list. Great thefts have not just robbers and motives, but also stolen objects of great value. What the Oklahoma City ownership group that pilfered the Sonics wanted was the Sonics, a team that had reached an impasse with the NBA over a new basketball arena. The league wanted Seattle fans to shell out money for a new arena. Tired after doling out arena subsidies for the Mariners and the Seahawks, elected officials in city government and in the Washington State Legislature refused. The Oklahoma City ownership group settled with the city of Seattle to finalize the franchise move, consequently taking possession of the Sonics' 1979 championship trophy, retired jerseys, and stadium banners commemorating conference titles and division wins. The Sonics would be relocated to Oklahoma at the start of the 2008 regular season, 2008-2009 regular season. Their name changed to the Thunder. On April 13, 2008, they played their last game in Seattle, a 99-95 victory against the Dallas Mavericks. That the Sonics were moving was unfathomable. In the book Hoops Heist, John Finkel describes how the Sonics had an unusually deep connection with the city's fan base. Several future NBA players that came from Seattle had gone to basketball camps put on by Sonics stars. Jamal Crawford, Isaiah Thomas, Nate Robinson, Jason Terry, and Brandon Roy were all gifted scorers. Smaller men who played in a big man sport, they embodied Seattle's struggle for national recognition. The Sonics were a basketball guild that elevated local talent through basketball apprenticeships, and this connection between town and team was uncommon in the hyper-materialistic world of professional sports. A rookie on the Sonics roster when the team relocated, departed superstar Kevin Durant later mourned the broken bond. Quote, the energy for the Sonics would have been unmatched in pro sports. The fans would have had an up-and-coming team with me, Russell Westbrook, Serge Ibaka, and James Harden. Sometimes I let myself think about what could have been, end quote. While the Oklahoma ownership group planned the relocation, Nick Licata of the Seattle City Council said that the Sonics contributed, quote, zero cultural and economic value, end quote, to the city. It's difficult to imagine a similar statement made about the Washington Huskies, Seahawks, and Mariners, who generated tailgate parties attended by generations of fans and initiated enthused pedestrian and transit trips to and from public stadiums. Although the economic benefits of sports to U.S. cities are usually overstated, 
it was at least true that these teams created material excitement worth millions in sales taxes, parking fees, bar and restaurant tabs, not to mention exceptional publicity for Seattle, a benefit identified by officials at the University of Washington way back in 1908. A similar dismissal of the Seattle storm as the one levied by Lakata against the Sonics would have drawn blowback from women and LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus fans who understood that fair cultural representation of marginalized populations strengthens a city's social fabric. To his credit, Lakata was at least smart enough to not go there. Under pressure, for, under pressure from constituents, the venerable council member later apologized for his inflammatory remarks. Many felt that what he had meant to say was that because the cultural value of the Sonics skewed disproportionately towards black Seattleites, the team was worth relinquishing. Back when professional basketball first came to town in 1966, Seattle sports establishment was so to embrace the two black NBA, but over the next decades, over the next four decades, however, the Sonics did as much to foster a feeling of belonging among still segregated black Seattleites as all the minority economic empowerment studies, racial sensitivity curricula for homicidal cops, and diversity task forces emerging from City Hall. To black city dwellers enduring waves of gentrifiers in the Central District, the relocation of the team may have seemed one more example of displacement at a time when city leaders let economic forces fritter away a Central District community that was forged against all odds. A mom and pop small business, the Supersonics were not. Before a people who had looked to sports as a symbol of resilience, the team's departure was met with a feeling of real loss. Everywhere you looked, Seattle seemed like a less black city. At any rate, the Sonics were gone now. Their sale was a proxy battle in the power struggle between blue coastal cities and America's red state interior. Parallels to the city's ra failed railroad rendezvous at the turn of the century are perhaps too obvious to not make. The city was shafted again by regional rivals and by distant capitalists. For many years afterwards, heartbroken Seattle fans were reduced to rumor mongers, desperately parsing any morsel of gossip that hinted at the team's return reproducing the local railroad speculation craze of the Gilded Age. At parks and in coffee shops, on transit and on social media, conversations about the departed franchise inspired defeated sighs and shaking heads. I still can't believe they let them get away. Because it was about politics, it wasn't their fault. Because it was about politics, it was all their fault. I think pretty little introduction needed for number three on this list, right? Somebody who, um, I mean, the third one I think means the most to a lot of people in this room, um, but somebody who, you know, has remained involved and engaged not just in sort of the national federal politics and helping Seattle earn um, some of the reputation that it has anyway as a very liberal city, but somebody who um, has also been very, very visible in trying to make the um, U.S. national team uh, or U.S., uh, sorry, Olympic sort of operation a lot more inclusive than it would have been otherwise. Um, and I think when you talk about um, Megan Rapinoe as an athlete that engaged sort of fan bases that uh, previously did not see themselves represented in the mainstream world of sport, um, that might be um, one of the most meaningful contributions that she left behind as well. So I think that... Um, Megan Rapinoe has a well-earned spot as the uh, number three athlete on this list of the most politically impactful sports figures in Seattle history. So we're getting to the top two here. There are a few names that we haven't seen just yet, right? It's starting to feel almost inevitable who the last two were. I think we heard a little bit about who one of them might be, but we don't know which order they're going to be in just yet, right? And before we get to number two, I wanted to read this quote that um, it's probably one of my the favorite pieces of literature, as it were, that I was able to run across in the, the process of researching this book. Um, and this is from Paul Goldberger's Ballpark Baseball in the American City, um, where he says, in the ballpark, the two sides of the American character, the Jeffersonian impulse toward open space and rural expanse, and the Hamiltonian belief in the city and in, in industrial infrastructure are joined and cannot be apart. They must coexist. The exquisite garden of the baseball field without the structure around it would be just a rural meadow, bereft not only of the spectators themselves, but of the transformative energy that they bring, and the stands without the diamond in the outfield would be a pointless construction. A recurring theme throughout this book is sort of this idea of the great American ballpark as a vehicle for uh, Seattle to compete with other cities, with the Clevelands and the Fresnos, Las Vegases of the world, 
um, and this idea that if we just pour enough money into the next stadium, this is going to be the thing that's going to put Seattle on the map, as it were. I mean, this is a phrase that shows up over and over and over and over again in um, the 170 years of history that this book covers. Um, the, the notion of putting Seattle on the map, right, and the ballpark being a way that that is going to happen. Um, and it's not just on the level of sentiment that that is, that that, that um, aspiration exists. It's also something that's backed up with tremendous financial and fiscal investment in our sports, um, in our sports facilities. So that number two on this list um, really ought to be there because if you take um, Griffey off of the 1995 Seattle Mariners, a team that was at that point in time really had its bag, pa bags packed on the way out the door, uh, probably was gonna be relocated to uh, Tampa. Um, you know, Griffey had an amazing American League Divisional Series against the Yankees. I think he was something like five for 11, uh, three or four home runs. Um, was probably the, they don't award most valuable player awards for ALDSs. If they did, it probably would be Griffey. And as a result, um, the Mariners were winning a bunch of games. They find their way um, into the American League Championship Series where they take, I believe it was a two games to one or a two games to none lead against the Cleveland Indians forced the hand of the Washington State Legislature that did not, absolutely did not want to devote public funds toward the construction of a new uh, sports facility. Uh, the Kingdom had tiles at that point in time that were uh, falling in. Uh, four, uh, I think it was 15 pound tiles fell. Um, luckily, it was earlier on in the day before there was a game in the 1995 season, the Mariners were actually, would have been condemned to have played their entire season on the road, um, if not for the fact that there was a strike. Uh, when uh, play resumes, um, Griffey, who I believe had suffered an, an injury at some point in time in the 1995, the subsequent season, um, comes back and is great, inspires this deep playoff push. State legislature, legislators really have no option but to um, devote the funds because which one of them wanted to be devoted, which one of them wanted to go down in history as the lawmaker that allowed the Mariners to relocate to uh, Tampa Bay. So when Governor Mike Lowry at that time reconvenes a special session in October of 1995, um, some $700 million of public funds go towards the construction of a stadium that eventually becomes Safeco Field, that eventually becomes T-Mobile Park. Um, and I think just for the sheer volume of political activity that the Mariners uh, forced uh, state and local lawmakers to take up, um, he has to be pretty high up on this list. Probably my favorite uh, question, this must have been probably the second or third book event that I've had the chance to do um, the third in person. And a question that has come up both times is sort of this idea of why is somebody who's interested in sort of uh, sports as a, uh, a receptacle for public collective passions, why would you pick sports as a topic to talk about this? I mean, and sports is really kind of the realm in a lot of ways of hyper individual exploits. It's an extremely ableist enterprise where we're praising often is not um, you know, amazing physical specimens for what they're able to do individually. And my response to it is always that um, what I see when I look at these games is much more what's going on collectively than individually. It's the fact that um, professional sports would not be possible were it not for organized labor. Everyone from the players to the concession stand workers are unionized. Um, often as not the broadcasters of the games belong to photojournalist unions as well. Uh, we're talking about games that are played um, in sports facilities that uh, would not be possible without huge gobs of public funds. So that um, when you look at the games that we play, I think you see a lot more collectivism than you do individualism. And you see a lot more people trying to figure out how to solve problems collectively than you do uh, the individualist part of it. Um, it's a long-winded way of saying that Ken Griffey Jr. was really, he was really cool. I mean, he was just fun to watch as a baseball player. Um, and if, if for no other reason, I think you, you'd put him high up on that list for the impact that he had on making baseball seem like a lot less of an establishment ki kind of sport um, at that point in time, and maybe even to a certain extent still. Um, baseball was kind of the old boys network, right? Um, the, the Red Sox, to take you know one prototypical example, um, even though Jackie Robinson had integrated Major League Baseball um, some 40 or 50 years le later, before the Red Sox had routinely started signing black players, um, it was a lot easier for people to believe that the Red Sox were bad all those years because of some metaphysical curse of, of Babe Ruth than it was to straightforwardly talk about the fact that 
they had no black people on the team, and so they were always going to lose to teams that did not wall themselves off from that well of talent. Um, and that was Major League Baseball for, for all intents and purposes for many people. And then you have Griffey playing, you know, hip hop hooray as his walk on music at the kingdom with the backwards hat and um, somebody who's getting shouted out by LL Cool J and Jay Z on rap records. So he was somebody who I think um, had the Tiger Woods effect, if you will, on um, baseball uh, seven or eight years before um, the actual Tiger, t Tiger Woods effect and the sport of golf. Betty Lennox, we already, we already um, sort of talked about that. Um, the uh, woman who won the 2004 Most Valu Valuable Player Award in the WNBA Finals. I talk about her story very briefly um, as uh, an athlete that uh, frankly was not making enough money from her WNBA salary and almost uh, two days after, it was two days after the uh, 2004 parade, she was on a plane to get ready to go play uh, professional basketball in Italy. And um, that's obviously a saga that has played out um, in many uh, different um, iterations and generations of the WNBA, but um, Betty Lennox was actually one of the first athletes to get, um, to bring that issue to the, to the forefront when you go back and, le and read um, the stories that were written about her in the Seattle PI and the Seattle Times. So uh, she's somebody who's covered in the uh, 10th chapter of the book. Um, and now let's get to number one. We need a drum roll. Drum roll. Do you have any guesses? Any guesses? Sue Bird? Some Sue Bird? All right, here we go. The number one most politically impactful sports figure in Seattle history is the Mariner Moose. It's the Mariner Moose. No, I'm just joking. It's not the Mariner Moose. Sue Bird. Sue Bird. Um, <laughs> So Sue is somebody who I think combines so many aspects of the figures that we've seen previously on, this, on the list between um, you know, activating and really animating a, a, a fan base of women and LGBTQ plus basketball fans. Um, I think that central to sort of her case as the number one is also an interesting thought experiment where what happens if she does not get drafted by um, the Seattle Storm, and I believe it was the 2002 or 2003 draft. We probably win way fewer championships uh, as far as the Seattle Storm are concerned, meaning uh, people are not really feeling like Key Arena is an arena that needs to stick around maybe for so much longer. Perhaps that is an arena that is never renovated. Maybe the Storm um, relocate at a certain point. It's perfectly plausible to me that uh, as a result of the Storm not going on a tremendous run of excellence where they win, I think it's four championships in 16 years. Um, Key Arena gets vacated, which probably might mean that there's no Kraken. On top of that, um, with the Key Arena being um, the arena um, that eventually became Climate Pledge, and it's also probably the case that Seattle would not be without a Climate Pledge in talks for receiving another NBA franchise, which is starting to feel more and more inevitable um, as the day, days go by. So when you, I think, combine the structural, institutional, public investment in sport with the social impact, I think it's a pretty clear-cut case between um, Sue and Ken Griffey Jr., and I give it to, I give Sue the nod for sure. All right, so why don't we take some questions? We got a couple of trivia. We got some, oh, we have trivia. We have more trivia. Two questions. Two questions, all right, let's do it. Yeah. Let's see if I can operate this. Is it here? Is it there? Yeah. There we go. Having a new path through trial rides and unapologetic meetups. What was the name of the first Northwest Women's Motorcycle Enthusiast Group? No, no bikers here? No bikers? <laughs> Anybody? Should I reveal it? Yeah. The Motor Maids. Chapter four. The fourth inning, they're covered in the fourth inning. And we got one more after this, right? I was gonna wait till we got to the, um, I was gonna improvise, frankly, and weave in an answer about them during Q&A. 
because that's how my brain works. Very nonlinear thinker. I'm going to go to the next one. The Seattle PI hailed their powerful batting attack and smooth working defense after a 21-1 victory over a white women's Bremerton team. What titles did the iconic Seattle Owls win? And they're actually the team that graces the uh, cover of the book as well. And I uh, talk about them in the uh, fourth inning of the book as well. You can guess too. Yeah, someone can guess. Oh, wow. All right. right That's here. one of them. One of them. You can have a consolation prize for one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Anybody else? You, somebody else want to get the, the next one? There's two titles. Anybody? All right. That one right here. I'm going to go countercultural on you and guess none because they were not eligible in any sort of a league or uh, recognized organized sport. That's a, uh, I would pull something like that. <laughs> you, you've got me pegged almost perfectly, but I think, you know, sports are, are such a mirror of our politics just in the sense that there tends to be one winner. So I, it was very important to me to highlight teams that were socially impactful, but also won. No consolation prizes. I think the, the excellence of it is part of the, the story. So um, under any other circumstances, I think you probably would have been, would have been right and had that, had that just right. But they actually did one, one other title, I believe. Can I reveal it? Mm -hmm. It was actually a city uh, championship, I think in 1939, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So great guess, a state softball championship. It's an awesome guess. Well done. All right, now let's do some Q&A. I'm tired of hearing myself talk. Right here. Sorry, let me run the mic to you. Sorry about that. I think the question was whether or not there was a picture of Betty Lennox to put up, not in this particular presentation, um, but Benny Lennox was somebody who, while I want to say Sue Bird was finding her footing as a, I think she was a second year guard at that point in time, um, did not play particularly well uh, in that series, was going against her, uh, the WNBA team from her, um, uh, where she had gone to college. They played the Connecticut Sun. Um, so there's some speculation in the papers that maybe she had been a little bit psyched out at that point in time. But Benny Lennox uh, really was the reason why the, where the Storm uh, won that series when you go back and look at how the games played out. So um, yeah, we definitely encourage everybody to read up a lot more about Betty, but she was, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, this isn't quite as much out of, from out of left field. Let's say it's from uh, deep shortstop. Here we go. <laughs> Is there a place in your analysis? I haven't <laughs> gotten your the copy of the book yet. Mm -hmm. um, for uh, outdoor kinds of sports, I mean, you mentioned the motorcycle team. I'm thinking of Lou Whitaker in particular mm -hmm. and REI. Maybe before him, the Mountaineers, uh, and then it slides through Phil Mayer, yeah. his brother, and so on, and some of the kind of combination competition and recreational sports mm -hmm. that that the the city sort of celebrates, even though we're an hour away from the ski hills. Yeah, I think the the to the to to both the letter and the spirit of your question. I think Seattle being a Western city, uh, the fact that we are as far West as we are really puts the city sort of in the middle of a lot of narratives about settler grit and self-reliance that um, a lot of settlers and white Americans in specific have been sort of telling themselves since virtually the founding of the Republic. So the establishment of a expansive park system, for example, at the turn of the 20th century um, was one of the first examples that we see in the city of massive collective mobilization to try to build up the city through sport and the idea that um, if in the, the, the imagination of a lot of white settlers, if we just sort of re, uh, resurrect the same settler spirit that uh, the generation of um, original settlers in Seattle had, uh, that's going to propel us as a city. As a result, you see um, huge sums of um, Actually, in a, an election, I believe it was in 1902, Seattle uh, 
voters elect to tax themselves to devote money uh, that would go towards the creation of a park system. The Olmsted brothers are contracted later on in that decade. Um, consequent to that, you see a lot of um, the effort to build great baseball parks in uh, Robert Dugdale is a real estate prospector who um, devotes a lot of funds towards the creation of Dugdale Park, which is one of the city's first major baseball parks. Um, so yeah, outdoor sports, and it also shows up as a story of regression too, right? The fact that in the 1920s, as you see people leading more car dependent lifestyles, um, as cities become more exclusive with the enactment of exclusionary zoning, um, mountain sports, skiing, mountain climbing really becomes kind of a leisure activity. There are some attempts to push against that trend. Anna Louise, Louise Strong, a socialist school board member, actually gets her political start as an open a public parks advocate um, and somebody who says that we need to have deep accessibility to Mount Rainier, deep accessibility to area peaks. But she's noteworthy because she's cutting against the trend. And the trend at that point, as Seattle's establishing segregated neighborhoods, as Seattle is becoming a city that is very bifurcated by class and by color, um, she's cutting against the grain. And the grain at that point was um, the creation of an exclusive city, I think, of, of which mountain, mountain sports were definitely a part. Yeah. Hi, um, you alluded, <coughs> excuse me, you alluded a number of times to the, the ongoing struck debate over how much, as you put it, great gobs of public money mm -hmm. uh, should go to stadiums, which are after all private enterprises, and most of those great gobs of public money go to private people. Right. Um, what's your take on when to say yes and when to say no and has your line on that changed since you started doing your research for the book? <clears throat> I come at it from, so the question is around whether or not I'm a hypocrite, right? Do, I, you, know, do you enjoy <laughs> sports and does that sort of chip away or do anything to sort of um, mitigate what your political beliefs might be around um, the fact that there are probably better uses for public funds? I think I come at it from an abundance perspective that says Seattle is one of the richest cities in human history and one of the richest states in the richest country, at least as far as money is concerned, so that when you have um, you know, corporations valued in the billions of dollars and immensely wealthy individuals, but no income tax, you're going to be forced into these kinds of questions about is it this or is it that? Do we get to enjoy bread or circuses? Can we have entertainment or, or do we need to focus on basic needs? My objection to the extent that exists to devoting public funds to sports stadia has to do with the fact that there is not a commensurate level of passion and engagement around similar kinds of public projects with respect to housing the homeless, with respect to uh, funding special education with respect to building social housing and building out bike lanes, building out everyday amenities that everybody can enjoy, not just the billionaire sports leagues that you call attention to, um, so that we really shouldn't be in a position where we have to be picking either or. And I think Seattle voters historically have, have felt more or less the same way. I mean, in the 1990s, um, voters voted down the initial measure that would have funded uh, the stadium that became Safeco Field, the only reason why that ended up getting built was because the state legislature really overruled the will of the people in a narrow election that took place in September of 1995. Voters said, we don't want to play for, pay for a corporate boondoggle and a corporate giveaway in the stadium. A couple of years later, they said, um, by a narrow, an equally slim margin, said in September of 1997, we're actually going to approve a football stadium that Paul Allen placed on the ballot because this stadium does a little bit more to pay its own way. It raises its own taxes. It is not a straightforward giveaway. So the way I feel about it, I think, is the way that Seattle voters have generally historically felt about it. Um, and we have these stadiums that have been built not because we necessarily wanted them, but because uh, elected officials had um, some other designs, and those designs did not include uh, installing a permanent income tax so that we didn't have to make these kinds of uh, decisions, um, choosing one or the other again. Yeah. We have a question up here. Yeah. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, first of all, I wanted to say thank you, Sean, for writing this book. Um, I read it. I don't know much about sports, and I was absolutely enriched by your insights and amazing research. Um, I love the structure of the book also. Uh, in your research, I heard you say that there were some commonalities about um, sports on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. Were there themes that you saw that were specific and unique to Seattle? Mm -hmm. So the, the question is around, I think, uh, how do you have, is it possible to have sort of an, an exceptionalist reading of Seattle and its history and its connection to um, its teams and to its sports? I tried pretty deliberately to steer away from that because I think, it, you know, it goes into a couple of things. The first thing I think about is I think the exceptionalist sort of narrative is really core to how the United States likes to think of itself generally. And I think that a lot of American cities, West Coast cities in particular, have um, sort of adapted that. There's no way that we can be anything like Portland. I mean, we would never make the same mistakes that Houston made. Can you believe, you know, the Denver Parks levy decision? I mean, the, the commonality aspect of it for me was way more important because you're you're getting to the this idea that, you know, there's there's no um, sort of primordial primordial Seattleness that we can tap into that's going to fix our problems. They can they, we can screw up our urban planning decisions the same way that Denver screwed them up. We can make the same mistakes that Los Angeles makes. We actually sprawl more than Los Angeles does, more than Miami does. We could be a city that um, does not actually earn the green reputation that we have. So there's no, to me, kind of manifest Seattleness that we're ever going to be able to dig up and rediscover. To the to the extent that that there is, I think it's when Seattle's Seattleites decide we're going to try to make decisions in the present that are not necessarily going to benefit us in the present. So we're going to make this Montlake cut, and it's going to take a bunch of years for that to happen. We might not necessarily see. The impact of it but when it does happen people are going to be voting the husky games we you know i might be a, a 65 year old voter in november of 1996 who's voting for the establishment of sound transit i don't know how long this train is going to take you know it's probably going to take a really long time knowing how seattle goes about its business but i'm going to cast this ballot for it because i know that they're going to people who are going to be coming after me who are going to be able to enjoy it um so i think it and and maybe that's similar to other cities or maybe it's not but I think that's the first thing that I think about is when collectively this, the decision is made to put something in the ground that you might not be able to see uh, grow. Um, we do a lot better as a city that way than versus when I think we're getting into a very self-interested mode where if we don't see a solution to this you know, conceptualized problem in 18 months, um, then uh, the city be damned. I mean, I think that that's kind of the mode that we've been stuck in for for longer than I think a lot of us would care to care to admit. Thank you. Yeah. Um, a couple more. Bring your hands. Yay! Thank you. Hi. Um, I just had this question pop in my head. Um, if you w would be a fan of, um, I guess, municipally owned uh, teams or arenas. And then as I thought that, is, is there not a major team that is collectively owned? Um, but yeah. Yeah, so many, so many great questions tonight. I mean, the, the question of uh, municipally owned and publicly owned sports franchises uh, in all of our four major sports leagues, with the exception of the NHL, it's actually forbidden in the league charters. I checked. Uh, NBA can't do it. Major League Baseball, you can't do it. The, the Green Bay Packers, which I think the closest thing that we have to a publicly owned um, franchise, um, they're kind of grandfathered into this law. Um, that didn't prevent them from publicly owning the Cowboys on uh, Sunday, I think it was, when that, that game took place. But... Um, as best as I understand it, their team ownership structure is, is more nominal than, than anything, so it's kind of like um, uh, titular public ownership, but the spirit of it still persists. What I, what I think of as kind of the next best thing is the arrangement that we have right now with um, both major sports leagues or teams that play their games within city limits so people can actually 
a bike or take the trains to the games. As it turns out, cities that have that def generally have higher levels of fan engagement. They tend to be noisier stadiums. People don't have to worry about parking so they can focus on what really matters, drinking and making a lot of noise at the games. <laughs> Um, you see something really similar with the University of Washington as well, which I think is straightforward. I mean, the UW football and UW sports teams are straightforward state property, right? We tend not to think of them that way, but that's what they are. I mean, the head coaches are generally the highest paid public employees in that given state. Um, were the players to actually be paid, they would be public employees as well. So I think the closest thing that we have in a lot of ways to the spirit of collectivism, I think, is in our college sports. Um, and you, I guess we can... Uh, you know, do our best to make sure the revolution comes really, really soon so that we can see publicly owned teams. I mean, that's the first thing that I would like to see. Yeah, so that's an awesome question. Yeah, maybe we'll do Cue a Jeopardy music. Cue the Jeopardy music, a couple more. Hi, Sean. How you doing? Good. I just wanted to echo um, Taha's uh, commendation for the book. It's really, um, really a fantastic read, especially for someone um, growing up locally and how illuminating it is on many levels. Uh, your awesome alliterations as well and just kind of the, pr the prose and poetic way in which you told the story, these stories. Thank you for noticing. Um, <laughs> so one thing that I was very interested in was just uh, the sense of place and how that plays in uh, into your book, you know, thinking about um, the kingdom and how that was a, con was a contested set of interactions, thinking of protests within the international district community, um, thinking of community choosing spaces, uh, what is today Cal Anderson Park and, um, you know, your telling of uh, the children that were there at what is today Cal Anderson Park and mm -hmm. how that was also contested. Right. So just kind of love to hear more about um, uh, the, the choosing of spaces for mm -hmm. sports to occur and uh, just some uh, how history is an important component of really understanding where this play is occurring. Yeah, the, the one, one other example that leaps to mind that is uh, talked about in the third inning of the book is the fact that the shell house where the UW uh, rowing team uh, practiced, uh, rehearsed, sort of did their, um, you know, cut their teeth before going on to compete um, nationally in the Olympic Games in 1936. That area in Montlake actually was a an indigenous um, canoeing location where you'd have racing competitions that would take place among uh, Coast Salish nations at that point, um, way before settlement. For me, I think the more specific a story that you tell is the broader the story actually becomes. You can run into problems as a storyteller when you're trying to make the story appealing to everybody by not making it specific enough. And there are people that are never gonna, never gonna visit Seattle that know about Husky Stadium because they see it referred to as the greatest setting in college sports by um, broadcasters on FS1 or whatever. There are people who are never going to visit Seattle that know, have a sense of what it must be like to go to a Seahawk game around Pioneer Square. Um, and certainly, you know, from 2020 forward, there are a lot of people who know where and what Cal Anderson Park is that would not have known about it were it not for the fact that it were uh, occupied briefly or that an area around it was occupied briefly. So I wanted to try to focus on areas that I think the general, um, that definitely somebody who's from and around and of Seattle would know about, but also looking at it from even more of a remove and saying, this is something that somebody may have heard about, but they did not know that there was kind of this deep history and that this area may have been the site for a tremendous competition over whether or not there should even be a police precinct anywhere around a Cal Anderson Park people who uh, might not have known that at one point in time, I mean, Husky, Husky Stadium did not exist at one point, right? There was a decision to make it exist. People had to build it, shovels had to go in the ground. Um, and what was that process like? So I think slowing the, 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 the story down and making it as um, uh, methodical as possible with locations that people felt like maybe they knew well, but, did, but you find out something new in the retelling of how it actually came to be established was a really big part of the story. So I appreciate that question, yeah. One more. Somebody want to close this out? We're signing books, right? Yeah. Awesome. All right. This has been really fun. Yay. Thank you so much.